Okay. Uh, just, I just want to talk about the agenda and then you can start. Uh, next slide. Just press the green, big green button. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, we'll get started. Please close the doors. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a very tight agenda. There's almost five minutes left <laughs> at the end. But we'll, do, we'll wing it like the Netlink guys, right? We'll take the break as well. Okay. So, uh, the agenda is on the screen. You can see that uh, Vlad is going to talk about the unlocking of the TC rules. A lot of effort he's been putting in. He presented in the last workshop and he's going to give us an update where he's at. Uh, there's uh, Amrita and I think you've got my old slides here. Uh, Am Amrita and Anjali, who's here. Okay, uh, we'll present on updates from uh, Intel. Andy made it, where's Andy? Uh, we'll present on uh, discussion of PCI register uh, stats trans uh, transfers from the hardware to the kernel. Uh, Simon will talk about uh, the uh, offloading TC rules on obvious internal ports. And then Lucas, uh, I hope he's here. Uh, 10 minutes on TDC and then five minutes for Roman. Okay. Uh, can you put it on next uh, slide set, please? Yes, the latest ones, yeah. Can you tell? Because I just noticed my agenda is the old one here. Is, is this the newest one you can tell? It is, eh? Yeah, my okay. The, the the latest ones. If yeah, the latest ones. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Vlad from Elanox, and today I would like to give you some update about efforts that I've been working on <laughs> for more than a year now. It's been kind of back and forth. It's also about challenges and lessons that I've learned. Uh, just a word of warning, it might not be interesting for experienced people here who already upstream a bunch of such uh, patch sets, but uh, it would have been quite <laughs> good for me to know something like this a year ago when I started. So first of all, I would like to give you a recap of what I've been doing. I already talked about this on previous TC workshop, uh, but uh, just a quick reminder. It's, uh, so today TC is using RTNL log for synchronization, which means uh, ev ev all, all the rule update infrastructure, deleting, inserting, even uh, dumping information about rules, everything is synchronized with one single log. And uh, even unrelated stuff, like, for example, adding, changing IP on your interface, uh, everything Netlink is using this log. So it's quite a big problem, especially, especially if you want to do this in parallel, because what I'm working on my company is uh, ASAP accelerated switching and packet processing. So we are using TC as a backend for our switching, uh, for embedded switch in our NIC, uh, in Connectix NIC. So it's a big problem, and uh, RTNL log can be held uh, for seconds for some operations. For example, you delete a queue disk with million rules on it, uh, it will just take the whole log for a second, you, you cannot do anything. So it's very problematic, and uh, my goal is to, to allow updating TC rules in parallel and making, make this part of TC infrastructure completely independent from RTNL log. So I started with the design that implemented reference counting, RCU, fine-grained locking on, on all layers, which is basically classifier API, action API, and specific classifiers that we use in our project is flower classifier. I think a lot of people are using it. And it is specific classifier which I would like to unlock and allow parallel execution on its slow, on its slow path. So the status is that uh, I have six uh, different patch sets because feature is big. It's like close to 100 patches. It cannot be submitted as one patch set. So 
I split it in six patch sets, and four of them are already upstream. Uh, one is on review in upstream, and last one is pending. I hope to upstream it for next kernel. Okay, so challenges and lesson learned. I will start with uh, very specific challenges that applicable to TC, which I faced in my development, and I will end with generic like suggestions for you how to make your life easier if you want to upstream some big changes to TC. So first of all, it's something very specific. So uh, since I'm doing locking, uh, for me, it's always a question of design whether to use something which lightweight, like spin lock, and defer everything to asynchronous context, or use heavy locking, like mutex. So <laughs> uh, we all know that asynchronous is fast. You can just do something very minimal and uh, make work you, do the work for you. It's very good for user space, for user space switches. Uh, and with this, uh, you can also use spin locks uh, because you don't need to sleep. You just schedule something to be executed on work you. But it's, uh, for me and seems for other people, it's quite hard to reason about because as soon as you start doing it, the Kazan use after three bucks are coming for you because you play something small in work you, but then it has pointer to something else which being deallocated in meantime. And uh, then you end up sending uh, multiple versions of your patch set and then multiple fixes for it afterwards. So another approach is synchronous. You just take a mutex or read-write semaphore and you lock everything. You wait for your operation to complete, which is considered heavy, at least in my mind. We will talk about it later, but generally how programmers approach this. But it's uh, very easy to reason about. You take the lock, you do everything you need, you release the lock. So what I learned is that you probably should not do asynchronous uh, implementation, asynchronous design, unless you, you really know you need it. So you need to have some results to justify it. Uh, so for my patch set, I did one implementation, which I did like a refactoring, I moved everything in a synchronous context, and then the maintainer just asked me, why are you doing this? <laughs> why do you need it? I said, because, okay, it's uh, mutexes are heavy, I just do spin lock, asynchronous, it's all nice and fast. He said, but are you sure it's fast? <laughs> so I had to do a proof of concept implementation with mutex and really compare the performance and uh, I can tell you that uh, last point in this you don't, should not be too fancy or clever because you either need to prove that you really need it or uh, don't do this at all. So just a uh, small, small discussion about spin lock versus mutex. So I did proof of concept implementation and it turned out that mutex is not as slow as I was expecting it to be. So in it's, uh, it's very specific to TC, so it's not like general performance evaluation of mutex, but if you want to lock something in TC, some object with mutex, that's the numbers you can expect. So without uh, contention, just an overhead of having mutex is very small, one to three percent. We are talking about slow pass here, right? Because three percent for fast pass, it would be huge, but for slow pass, it probably isn't worth complicating your code for. So, and in very congested case, it's, I, I intentionally try to make it as slow as possible. So 70% is as much as you will go if you like do something very stupid while holding it. Basically here it's linear search. I add a bunch of chains to TC and then I have to linear search through them while holding the mutex. So th these numbers, they're quite good for mutex actually. So my advice is use mutex by default unless your design, by design you need it. Like if you need lock to take lock in some atomic context, like fast pass, you have to use spin lock. But uh, don't just use it as, you know, premature optimization. Okay. So I did some profiling and it's just implementation details that I did not know about uh, mutex in Linux kernel. It actually what it does is uh, it does busy wait, uh, busy looping, same as spin lock if current holder of the mutex is executing on, C on CPU. So if someone took the mutex and sleep, it will also sleep. But if someone who has the mutex is executing on CPU, it will try to busy wait. So that's why it's uh, like relatively fast because you actually don't need to go to scheduler and uh, you know preempt your threads while waiting for mutex. So it's last two lines of this, you can see that it's 
busy waiting. Or ISK lock, it's optimistic spinning, it's kind of uh, internal, another internal optimization which basically prevents uh, multiple, uh, multiple tasks from spinning on exactly the same on same lock, so it's kind of queues them, but only one uh, task is is uh, is busy waiting on specific waiter. So anyway, it's uh, quite fast. So unless you have reason to use spin lock, uh, unless you have reason to use uh, spin lock, don't use it. Um, so it's more generic suggestion implement test cases because <laughs> it seems obvious, but a lot of people uh, don't uh, submit their changes with the company in test cases, and some don't even run the tests for even existing tests for their changes at all. So <laughs> make sure you pass existing tests, and uh, if you're doing something risky like locking, make sure you create tests for your stuff because as it happened to me, I submitted a change. Then I had to, you know, go and implement tests for it afterwards because I had my private private tests in frameworks that are used in our company. But <laughs> it's not good for upstream because first of all, my maintainer cannot verify how I test if it's my private tests. And uh, another major reason is that uh, another people who might be doing changes afterwards to your code, they cannot verify that they don't break uh, your uh, your locking and parallelism. So submit changes. And it's, uh, I don't know if all of you know about this, but it's uh, now very easy to do. We have uh, TDC based, uh, basically it's a Python based testing framework, but you don't need to know or write any Python probably unless you're implementing plugins for this, for this framework. You just uh, insert uh, like initialization commands and test commands and verification commands in JSON file and it will run everything for you. It will generate your test ID, it will do everything. So if you are not using this, go and use it. It's quite nice. And uh, if you need something on top, just uh, send the uh, patches, implementing plugins. Uh, yeah, and uh, also not everyone is doing this. Please run tests with Kassan and log debugging because uh, test, uh, your code might not necessarily crash the kernel, but you may have some, you might have some quite hard to find uh, problems like use after free and uh, you will probably not reproduce them on single test run unless you have Kazan and other kernel testing infrastructure enabled. So <laughs> please use it. Another point is uh, write descriptive cover letters. So again, I had this problem when I send my nice patch set, which I really like, but then we end up discussing my cover letter instead of my code and uh, <laughs> It's uh, quite unfor unfortunate and discouraging for you, but uh, basically you have to approach your cover letter from point of view of person who did not read the code yet, because when writing cover letter, you, me, I already wrote my code, I end up with cover letter, it's the last thing I do. Maybe I should start with cover letter, but that's a whole other point. So anyway, when you already wrote the code, it's quite obvious for you, you write very dry cover letter, but then people in upstream, they start with cover letter, and if they don't understand it, they will just not review your code, or you will end up having a week of discussion of your cover letter because uh, it's confusing for them. They will be asking questions. So just try to proofread your cover letter before sending. It will save you a lot of time and a lot of frustration. Uh, so submit early. if. Uh, with big patch sets, if it's not one patch change, uh, it's better for you to submit early in the cycle because uh, what I had uh, <laughs> recently, don't, don't count on uh, David Miller to take your patch set when it's RC7, you know, last Friday. It's, it will probably not happen and you will have to resubmit because uh, the way it goes for uh, like patch sets with cover letter, people uh, who reviewing them, they usually, you know, have other more important stuff to do besides reviewing my patch sets. So they just delay it until maybe they have some time at Friday evening. And then if they don't, they delay it till next Friday evening. So expect it to take one, two weeks just to get feedback for your initial submission, you know. So just you have to really plan for it if you want to get it into the current release. 
also it's better to send early because then other people will, will end up merging with your code. Otherwise, you will have to merge with their code because if your patches do not apply clearly, it's your job to, to merge them, to rebase them on top of current net next. And sometimes it's not just rebase. I had to do several redesigns because, you know, <laughs> for example, uh, user space chain API, it completely changed the classifier API design for me and locking. So it's also, it's very time consuming, you know, to chase the upstream. Try not to try to make upstream chase you <laughs> submit early. So general approach. So in general, what I did, I wrote uh, like 150 patches with our driver also because uh, it's, it has it, its own drawback and benefits. So when you write whole solution first, it cannot be submitted a single patch set. You cannot send 100 or 150 patches because it will not be accepted. You have to break it down to smaller patch sets. And the nice thing about it is that you, have, you can validate your whole design because you have everything. You just run tests and you know if it works or it doesn't work. But uh, b besides that, what I already told you about, the upkeep cost, you have to constantly rebase, and sometimes not just to rebase, but refactor and redesign to accommodate upstream changes. Uh, so it's very time consuming. But uh, on the other hand, if you don't do this, uh, you either have to be very knowledgeable in uh, the part of kernel you are changing, or you will get it wrong, because I know that. <laughs> I threw away several of my initial designs because when you just look on it from high level point of view, everything is easy. Okay, just add lock here, just add a reference counter there. But when you go down to this, you have to change APIs in between different uh, subsystems. Like I had to change classifier API to implement unlock classifier because the current API was not uh, not enough. I need to do reference reference counting and, for example, it. Uh, had uh, like get function, but didn't have any kind of release functions. So I have to implement it, and I have to modify the API to really always take the reference and release it. So I mean, it's very easy. It's only few ways to get it right, and multiple, a lot of ways to get it wrong. So that is something you have to design for your, to decide for yourself because it's both approaches have their own benefits. Okay. okay, questions? No questions? Okay, Mike. So there's a lot of, or there are concerns from time to time about the performance of TC in general. Um, and it, you said that you have a patch under review um, I'll admit I haven't read the change log entry for it. Is there a performance boost um, with TC, the TC Flower uh, with your new set? So what I'm working on is to allow to call it from parallel tasks, not to improve a single, like single threaded insertion rate. So, but my goal is not to degrade single thread per sub insertion rate because, you know, I implement currently just one single log taken at the very top of the call chain and then nothing has to, you don't have to worry about anything else. But with my changes, it's a bunch of, you know, atomic reference counters, uh, fine-grained logs, so I don't expect it to improve uh, single threaded insertion rate at all. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, uh, actually, just a few minutes, and I think they're trying to connect remote uh, speaker. But so, um, for the record, what's the number of single thread right now? So, <laughs> short answer or long answer? Um, you one minute answer. Okay, right. so right now there is a bug. Uh, it's uh, related to per CPU counters usage. Uh, uh, there was like unrelated change by. Eric Dumazet, and he right. just said some uh, alignment for one structure, and it degraded insertion rate from 60, 60, 65 k rules per second to 40 k rules per second. Okay. So I like wrote all my debugging information and sent it to per CPU counters maintainer. I think they came up with like 12 patches patch set that uh, fixes the issue. 
but okay. it's not going through net next. I think they have the, their own. Okay, so th th this is this is sixty five thousand updates of flower plus actions or just flower or uh, flower plus action. It's uh, without driver. Everything w without driver. It's flower just, with just single action, right? Not not all the way to the hardware. Yeah, without hardware. Okay, and if you have sixteen threads, if you have sixteen CPUs running in parallel, you can do sixteen times that or. Without my changes, everything is synchronized with their TNL log. And with my changes, it depends on whether or not you are targeting the same, for example, uh, QDisk, uh, chain, TP instance. Right. So it depends. If you're not, not targeting it, you are basically embarrassing the parallel. Right. Everything is parallel. But if you are targeting them, it's, uh, okay, get, so gets, uh, you get less benefit. Okay, okay. So, but, but in the best case scenario, uh, you're not targeting them. You can get 16 times for 16 threads or? close to that? It's less, but uh, I think I presented it in my previous talk. I was right. getting several hundred thousands per okay. second from okay. 10 threads. Okay, a and we're not expecting hardware to be a problem in the end. You once, you, once, once you funnel and you're sending this to the hardware, it's going to slow down a little bit, yes? Yes, but it depends on the hardware because a lot of drivers are plugged into TC and uh, my goal is to just to call the hardware without uh, holding any kind of RTNL lock on top, and then it's up to driver implementation to okay. be as fast as it can be. Okay. That should be interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker we're going to try a remote. Is, is it doable? Can it be done? Huh? There is a speaker. There's uh, somebody. Can, uh, can you give them control of the of the... Yeah, you, you can try, maybe, she wants to present, yeah, she wants to present, right, um, yeah, he finally put the correct agenda. Years ago to work yes. around switches that can't deal well, with I identical think, IP think, addresses in different sure VLANs. Minute, filter, what, does that, what does it do? Get rid of those guys. Um, you can say EV tables B route, and then Oh. Specify some filter criteria like oh. a mega address wrong, and a peer wrong, address. Wrong, uh, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Quick. <laughs> okay, so she wants to. Okay, we got, we got 20 minutes. So. Should we just go to the next presentation while you're fixing this, or? Yeah, okay, I guess. Huh? Oh, I mean, she's there, she's online right now, connected to, Ju uh, to Jupiter. Uh, say that again? Okay, okay, so let's do the next. Can you put the agenda? I don't remember what the next one is. I think maybe you are, Andy. I could be wrong. Uh, yeah, it, it. Okay, yeah. Um. Oh, she's there. I can see her. I can, I can see her on the screen. Yeah. Are you able to put her? Huh? No, I mean here. I have I, I connected through blue jeans. I can see you. Can you hear me, um, Amrita? Shake your head if you. Yes, she can hear me. <laughs> <laughs> I asked to shake her head, but she didn't fall for it. She went. <laughs> you will probably want to say something this one. Uh, still. Still, wrong, wrong, wrong guy. <laughs> no, 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 remove pub. <laughs> it's kidding. Uh, yes. Um, okay. Uh, maybe maybe we go to the third one. Can okay. we go to number three? So my name is Pablo. I'm going to follow up with a summary of updates that happened um, in the net filter. Let's go to number three, and then we'll come back to this. In the filter called base, in the, since the last net. Okay, so uh, 
So this is, um, okay, yeah, Andy with stats, yeah. Ooh, that's loud. Yeah. All right. All right, ready? Yeah, you. Close Go enough? Ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, Jamal asked me to come up and talk for a few minutes. Uh, hopefully other people will fill in the gaps and talk more than me uh, about uh, gathering of hardware stats uh, and how it's not efficient. Um, kind of as we move towards the future. Oh, now we got. Now we got her here. <laughs> <laughs> she can't see me. <laughs> I feel kind of bad about this. Okay. Um, yeah. So right now, uh, if you have a small number of actions in hardware, gathering stats is not really a big deal. Um, but as we scale up to millions of rules or actions, uh, frequent updates are uh, not going to be efficient anymore. Um, this is also true for software. Uh, Jamal can go on and on about uh, some of the, the software things that have been done. Um, why do we care about stats? Uh, billing, apparently that's important to people to buy these things. Um, Maintaining SLAs, also important, uh, and network or action troubleshooting. I know for a fact, uh, if you're doing TC rules and hardware, um, sometimes it's good to look at the hardware and know whether or not these things are actually being hit if you can't figure out where your packets are going. So um, we'll just go to the next one. OK, all right. So here are some of, the, um, some of the reasons we need to think about this or some of the suggestions that people have had. So again. Number of actions can make pulling all the counters in any poll period not very scalable. Um, one, of the, one of the 99 problems. Um, so I want this to be interactive. So anybody that has a suggestion, which I'm sure we have lots of smart folks in the crowd uh, who can make a suggestion. But here's a couple that we've come up with. Um, and it was, uh, was it Edward Cree from Solar Flare that also had some suggestions, Jamal, and started some of the discussion on the list? He's not listening, of course. Um, it was Edward. Was it Edward from Solar? I don't need a mic. To yeah, ask yeah, him. I think, uh, yeah, Ed, I tried to invite him, but he couldn't okay. make it, right? Okay, that's fine. Um, so we kind of started the discussion, uh, but couldn't be here. So I want to maybe track some stats, updated stats with a bit field. This would require some hardware support. Uh, so then you could say, oh, only these are changed. Query for those. Um, if you're designing hardware right now to be used in the next while, um, that would be useful. Uh, if your hardware doesn't support that, you're probably not going to be a big fan. Um, you, you know, one of the things to consider, too, that the speed of network interfaces, um, as well as the size of the, um, in your hardware to support the counters. If it's large, you're going to see wrapping. If your polling period is not frequent enough, this is another kind of issue to think about. Um, another one is if we, if we push the stats block just to host memory uh, and have it updated uh, automatically, um, constantly by hardware. Um, you could allow the kernel to have a field that's up to date, but you also have to do some synchronization there to make sure you're not in the middle. So uh, that's kind of all I have to say, surprisingly, uh, or not. Yes. So um, looks like we have a suggestion okay. over there. So the that? idea is, look, if, if we're going to pull a million stats and you're doing billing, you want the correct stats, okay, synchronized at the right time. Yeah, so unsurprisingly, we have some experience in this area. Um, Yes, it's a big problem. Um, so the approach that we've taken is kind of the last point there is we do it asynchronously. Um, but this kind of uh, pushes the problem to a different place. So I actually have problems there. Uh, uh, so there's kind of two approaches I suppose you could take. One is to push deltas of the stats. Um, and the other one is to push absolute values of the stats. And then, of course, you could try and be smart and only push the ones that have changed. Um, so kind of the obvious trade-offs here is like if you, if you push your absolute values, then you're increasing the volume of the data because you need a bigger value, right? Uh, but the downside of doing the delta is you, if you miss one, you, you, you drop the information, right? Uh, so I, we do the deltas, um, but we've had to take particular care on the driver to make sure it's fast enough to keep up with these things this has been an issue. We, we think we're on top of it now, but to, um, so, but, but on the, ho we, we don't see many problems on the host side in terms of collecting the stats because of, um, it, we have them stored in memory, as, as you're suggesting. Um, obviously, there's, there's inherent issues as per the previous presentation with <laughs> collecting stuff. <laughs> So but in general, I mean, I, I don't. I'm just sharing a little bit of experience there, but I agree this is a big problem with scalability. 
Um, and, and I guess my main point is it's not just between the host and the, the kernel and the user space, it's also between the host and the cloud. Yeah, and I think that's, that's my, I think the, the primary interest for me is it's not just, and I think you're right, it's the hardware and, and it, it's all of them, but I think the hardware and the kernel in particular I think is the most, is so the most yeah, challenging as you look well, at a hardware. If, if you have a, a million flows, and, and uh, even just one stack per flow, how often do you want this information synchronized? And no, well, telco guys want it every, they bill every six, six seconds, for example. Yeah, yeah. So, so they want it to be accurate within that range. Right, right. So these numbers, it gets, you, you, it's a lot of information for the host to have to process. Right. No so uh, w what is the bottleneck from the, from the hardware? Is it the PCI bus or I think that's one thing you so say. In our experience, it's, the, it's not the PCI bus. I mean, so you should be able to, I assume you, well in our case, we're using message-based passing. Um, and you can pack multiple stats into one message, of course. Uh, but it's, it's more the host has to, to store these efficiently. And it's very <coughs> efficiently being the keyword. Otherwise, it can't keep up. So the, the, the patch we put in, I wonder if that's doable in hardware as well. You want to describe that a little bit more? The, the timestamp. This was back in 2018, 2017 maybe. We dump actions, and actions have a timestamp when it was last used. So you can actually send a message, a get, and put a filter to say, give it to me if it's been updated only. Well, and <coughs> you, you put a range I'm, of time. I'm familiar with that work. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think another problem you have with hardware maybe and this hardware is different, but uh, you do actually want to flush these out of the hardware because yeah. the hardware has its own capacity problems. <laughs> but do, can you do a timestamp trick as well? or you c it, There's no such thing there. Well, so I come back to delta versus absolute value. If you're only doing deltas, you have to store less information and then you keep flushing it out. If you're, you're storing more absolute values, which I think would probably be required for the timestamp approach, then well, you have to store more information in the hardware. You're consuming more memory, basically. But what does delta mean? You mean, do you, if it's a 32-bit value or 64-bit value, do you send less information to, to, the, to this kind well, of is, Yeah, I mean, say, say you have a byte counter, um, and uh, say you plan to flush it out every second, then you might be able to get away with, say, a 32-bit value. But if, you're, if you want it to be cumulative, you'd need a 64-bit value, right? So you've just doubled the storage requirement, and that's without the storage requirement of the timestamp. Okay. So I, I mean, I'm not saying the scheme is, is with not without merit. I just say <coughs> it's not a clear win. Right, and, and if your hardware doesn't have support for storing this timestamp value or anything like that, it's going to be a while. So uh, out of curiosity, let's say I do uh, TC filter flower get and it has an action that has stats, how do you guys implement it? Does it, at that point, go and retrieve it from the hardware, or you're so periodically a, updating the kernel? It, it just gets it from the, the cache copy in the cache. kernel. Well, no, cache isn't the right word. The, the, the counters are kept in the kernel, and they're periodically updated by the hard, uh, as a result of messages from the hardware. What, what does periodically mean? Five Multi multiple times a second. Uh, okay, uh, it's, well, it's not definable. Yeah, yeah, it's asynchronous to the user space. So there's a clear, obviously there's a lock somewhere. Um, but but the, when the user space just gets what the kernel thinks is the right values. And only the kernel knows because only the kernel, because we're only sending deltas from the hardware, the hardware doesn't actually know. It just knows how many new packets have been in the la since the last time it sent it. So, so in this scenario, basically, I'm content if I do a get and I dump it just it doesn't touch the hardware. It doesn't touch the hardware, but there's probably a lock which stops the hardware from updating or yes, something like that. But you you can ha have a amortize that, of course. You can double buffer it also. Mike, yeah, we we the, the pulling from user space is is much less of an issue for us. Okay, so what do other hardware vendors do? Srida, who do you, any idea what you guys do or Kavya? Yeah. Right. So uh, Marvel now. Uh, Marvel. Used to be sorry. Too. sorry. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So uh, what's most convenience, convenient for us as a hardware vendor is to maintain on the host updated values. And actually, they can be deltas or e easier for us absolute values. Um, and for hosts to pull them w w when convenient, right? at their whatever rate you like, um, 
That's the easiest thing for us as a hardware vendor to do. And this can consume a lot of memory, maybe if there is a lot of connections, right? but to maintain an updated database on the host. So by definition, the, the database is sitting in the host. And uh, this could be, uh, depending on the uh, specific structure of the stats that's desired, but this could be uh, without even driver intervention. Driver will be part of setting it up, but it will not be part of every update. Right? The hardware will just push it there, uh, direct DMA. Interesting. So, Mike. That would be the fastest thing you can do, right? You basically DMA into application buffers, and you double buffer it, so you don't have to take a log, and you, you'll be behind for a while, and hardware will eventually catch up. The question, I think, is back to what was said earlier, which is, what is the application that's processing these million, two million, three million entries per second? I mean, is the, how widely distributed is that? Is that sharded? Do you try, yeah, yeah, you try, so uh, the application is sitting in user space. It's sending to some cloud controller. It's sucking this, mostly in our case, for example, it's just billing information. So it happens that there's some action based on stats is, is, is used for user data accounting. So, so the question here is, right, I think in the case of TC, trying to do formulated output, it makes sense. Right. If you're thinking about how this would be generic data statistics off of networking, it can get, A, very large. It can be very poorly set up, as in they might span cache lines in all the wrong ways because I have TX counters clumped together and RX counters clumped together and blah, blah, blah. And I think this is something that it would be a good thing for somebody to say, this is a spec and this spec can do whatever, 10 million ops per second or something like that, right? So example, port stats, I'm probably not as excited to get them every f really up to date. Jamal, you're saying you're not excited by stats? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I said I'm less, I'm more oh, excited okay. by less action excited. stats. Okay. Right. So any other hardware vendor that may have a different approach? Okay. <laughs> So I'm not a hardware vendor, and in fact, I'm quite naive on hardware, <laughs> um, which leads me to my little bit of a disconnect here. So you said we, we have millions of actions, and these have to be reported every five seconds. But I would point out, Nick's, you know, we're in, in XDP, we're dropping like 20 million packets a second. And we can, we can take um, TCP all the way up to user space and get like 10 million packets per second. So I'm, I'm missing why is, I'm, it's a it's simple, simplistic question. Why is that so hard when we can do packet processing so well? Okay, so, uh, you're asking why do we need hardware offload or? <laughs> so I think, no, Jamel, so we, we don't, we get good performance even without hardware um, offload and packet processing, right? So we're collecting these stats in hardware. We can ship them up to the host, I can't believe, Believe that's more data than packets are providing. I see. So, so what am so, I missing? Okay, okay. So you're saying the the bandwidth or channel to kernel is already there. Why is this? If we can do it with data path, why can't we do it with a control path? So look at it this way: is is this control path for statistics a appreciable percentage of what a data path would be? So am I using five percent of my PCI bus just for stats? Is that the problem? I, I I'm not. I don't know. I mean, so what? Is, what is the aggregate throughput I need for statistics? That's a great question. I mean, there's a, we can do simple math and probably figure this out. But I think to kind of get back to you, everybody's probably got an answer. But I, I think, but I have this mic, so um, I think one of the. One of the things is that the control path to a lot of these devices is just not as good as the packet path. And no one wants to really say that, probably out loud, but I will. Um, and then we have numbers to back that up, and I think everybody probably does. Okay, here's what you should do. You should create packets in the device carrying your statistics <laughs> and send them up to the host. As d <laughs> du duly noted. So, and problem solved. Duly noted and previously suggested. Um, so that in so our I case, that's exactly what we're doing. So right. So I have come <laughs> to this. I All right. It so. certainly may work uh, if you don't need to forward packets. If you need to forward packets and you need to do it fast, you cannot just do it through a, CP, a CPU. It, it wouldn't be uh, fast enough. So 
you have to gather the statistics and push it uh, to the CPU. But uh, uh, one one issue I see uh, about uh, uh, about the asynchronous uh, thing, which you do and you do as well, and we do in uh, Mellanox do in uh, MLX5, we do it asynchronously as well, is that you kind of break uh, causality because I, I have a test case when I send the packet and then I go to the counters and I don't see the packet counted. So that's wrong, right? It's, <laughs> it, you, you, don't, you, you cannot experience it when you are using uh, software only. But uh, when you do offloading, you can experience it. In MLXSW, in our switch driver, we, we just pull whenever I, I, the user wants to get the statistics, we go all the way down to, to the hardware and we get the, the recent statistics. So that can't happen. But with asynchronous, that's a problem, I think. Mm -hmm. but, but your approach here is not very scalable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Says other Mellanox employee. But, I mean, of, of course, with asynchronous, it, there's a potential for delay. But it would depend on the sampling rate. <laughs> of course. So, but <laughs> so, Tom, regarding your question, why, where is Tom? Uh, hi. Why, why is that? If you guys know to do packet processing, hey, how can you do? Can I do stat processing? So I was planning to explain you the problem, and then you said the solution. So <laughs> um, these this are control objects, as Andy said. And uh, like in the TCP case, you said you can forward th this and that millions of packets per second, but they let's say they belong to one one, one flow or or a, a small number of flows that the number of control the hardware control job object is is limited, right? That if you if you take millions flows, each one of them has a control object, and then you start to get into hardware cache misses and stuff like that, and then the, probably uh, one of the ways to solve that, as you suggest, is to apply the the data pass approach to the control pass. <laughs> so people are looking at that, I, I assume. Okay. Do do we want to continue this discussion after? I think uh, it looks like a lot of player, the players are here. Maybe we can have coffee somewhere and discuss. I'm going to cut it here. Sounds great. Okay, thanks. Already? Okay, we're going to switch to remote control from Amrita. I don't know what time it is there right now. Hi, Jamal. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, everybody else can see you, not just me. And I think you're displaying in multiple rooms, probably, which is good. <laughs> okay. Um. Can I start? Yeah, yes, please. Uh, the slides, has slides, can, if you can. Uh, yeah, number two. Um, so here I go. Uh, I just have some very quick updates from Intel on TC hardware offloads. Uh, so the first thing we started last year was uh, supporting uh, matches on port ranges in the TC classifier. Um, can you switch to the next slide, please? Yeah. Um, so our first work involved uh, supporting matches on port ranges in the uh, TC classifier. Uh, so we have hardware that is capable of offloading um, filters that match on a range of ports and this can be done as a single rule in the hardware. Uh, so we first looked at the U32 classifier and uh, the U32 classifier comes close to offloading range based rules uh, but had certain limitations. Uh, U32 required power of two ranges and uh, these ranges were taken as mask value pairs, so uh, uh, it, it cannot just be a, a simple range in the form of min and max fields. And uh, non-power of two ranges in U32 had to be split into multiple power of two ranges, so multiple rules. Uh, so splitting into multiple rules, even for offloads, uh, just takes away the performance benefits uh, in being able to offload to a hardware that can implement these as uh, single rules. Uh, 
and in software uh, there, there are other software infrastructures that actually support uh, port range rules like ip set and emach trees uh, so um, ip set takes these ranges as min and max values emach tree uh, does uh, less than or greater than comparison uh, but these do not support hardware offloads and in ovs these are uh, again uh, bitwise matches uh, uh, require that require power of two ranges and need to be split into multiple rules for non power of two ranges so um, in the next slide um, our uh, best candidate was tc flar uh, so uh, how the challenge is that uh, TC flower uh, is based on the R hash table lookup using mask based keys which is again not ideal for range matches uh, but then we already support uh, filter offloads through TC flower in our devices uh, so this was the best candidate to work with um, so essentially we just introduced a range comparator in tc flar in addition to the already existing r hash table lookup so we uh, could now support matching on destination and source port based ranges as min and max values and these could also be combined with uh, other existing match fields so for example you could match on uh, ip protocol types Uh, destination or ip source address destination ip source port range all as a single rule uh so the idea here is that every time a new filter is added a range uh, when a range filter is added uh, a new mask is created with min and max fields and a range but is set in the mask uh so for filter validation validations like checking if the filter exists it's just the regular r hash table lookup that flar already had um when the packet arrives the skb is classified uh using a two step process so the first stage is the uh, uh look up in the filter list for the range so the skb port uh, can be compared against the min and max uh, values in the range filter and if the range match succeeds then proceed to the next stage which is uh just do the regular r hash table lookup for rest of the skb fields uh but in software this is less performant because there's just a linear search in the filter list and uh software emach uses tree based searches which is more performant but uh this method scales from a hardware offload point of view uh so in the next slide i have an example uh, um so uh, he here's how you could just match on a uh, destination port range um with 20 and 30 as uh, the range values and uh, this is just a flow dump for uh, packets that matches match this flow um and in the next slide i have another example uh, which combines um destination ip base match and destination port base match as a single rule and the corresponding flow dump for that um so that's about range support um so in the next slide uh i'm going to can, talk can, can of can i can i ask um, a question uh, amri any so, questions okay you say uh, the the problem with u32 is you may you will have to use two rules yes because the first one Yes. Power of two, and then if there's any left over, you have another rule. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, isn't that how your hardware probably works? How, how are you implementing range? Yeah. So the hardware basically uses a TCAM ternary CAM, um, you know, classifier. I'm sure, you know, hardware folks here are uh, familiar with it. So uh, with that, uh, you know, it's it's not an exact match lookup. so it can do the range rules differently like an action okay uh, given uh, i'll talk to you later but we can do tenary matches in u32 as well right okay sorry go ahead uh so we further extended uh u32 offloads that we already support on ixgb 
uh, IXGB so far supports U32 offloads for matching on L3 and L4 headers and uh, the action supported were drop or redirect to a forwarding device like SRVVFs or Mac VLAN devices. Uh, so we added uh, extensions to support uh, more TC actions uh, like the action accept and action SKB edit mark. IXGB supports a 15-bit mark value. So these are essentially flow director rules in the hardware in a single uh, flat IXGB table. And uh, both these actions uh, uh, have a queue selection policy, which could be one of the two. So it could either be a round robin selection implemented internally in the driver, or it could be uh, uh, from a user specified flow ID or class ID fields. Uh, the minor number in the flow ID or class ID field can be used to select the queue. Uh, and this is just an ongoing work. It's not available in the upstream IXGB driver. Mm, moving on to the next slide. Um, this is how IXGB supports uh, offloading mark action. So uh, this first an ingress rule on the PF device, uh, which matches on, uh, say, IP protocol values or destination and source IPs or port values. And the action is uh, marked with a metadata value. So as packets arrive and uh, finds a, a rule in the hardware and matches on this rule, the packets get uh, marked with a metadata value. And uh, these packets could be accepted into the queue based on one of the queue selection policies. And as they are sent up the stack, uh, there's a software rule in the there's a software rule using the uh, firewall mark classifier matching on the metadata value and the action is to redirect it to the next PF. Uh, so the performance gain here is that the first level of classification is done in the hardware and this work is also ongoing is not available in the upstream IXGB driver. Um, moving on to the next slide. A question here, uh, Anjali. Question here. Yeah. Yeah. So you said you're forwarding for PF0 to PF1. This is what you're doing? Sorry, uh, this is regard regarding the mark so action? This or? can be done only in software? Yeah, uh, we, we're not forwarding here uh, to from PF0 to PF1. We're just marking. No, but on the slide, you said that you forward it to PF1. I think the previous slide. Oh, oh, OK. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Slide seven. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's software. Oh, it's software. Continue. So, if I heard the question right, the forwarding is only in the software. Yeah, yeah. He, he was wondering how you you got after you use SKB mark to forward to another device, you do that in software in your second stage. That's okay, continue where you left over, because we're gonna run out of uh, time. So here's some future work we are planning to do on uh, in the Intel devices. So we plan to extend our driver uh, to support uh, stats on offloaded flower filters. Um, I think Andy just uh, completed his talk on stats. So we are planning to query our hardware counters offloading the TC flower stats command and uh, update the stats and also support aging, um, again, based on querying these counters periodically. So our big concern here is that um, uh, querying the counters for every offloaded filter is kind of a performance hit. So uh, we would like to have the counters queried only for uh, certain filters. Uh, so uh, uh, I mean, uh, the solution we propose is a, a sort of a TC action counter uh, that could associate uh, stats with only a certain offloaded flows and not all offloaded flows. Uh, so question for you. So you have 
Sounds like you have some time stamp. That's how you're doing flow aging, yes? There's some time stamp in yes. the hardware, right? Uh, are you able? Yes. Uh, are you able, therefore, to dump based on timestamp? Let's say timestamp is has not something that hasn't been updated in five seconds. That's the as a filter. But uh, that should be done for uh, supporting aging, right? No. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, Jamal's question was: uh, Can our hardware uh, dump counter uh, only if? it was hit, I mean, the flow was hit in last uh, few seconds or whatever. Um, otherwise, yeah. Uh, uh, so the answer is the present hardware doesn't. Uh, so this is, this is more of uh, what Amrita is talking to is flow aging from software mechanism based on counter reads. And uh, the thing that she was trying to solve is, can I associate counters to certain filters? Or if I'm putting, say, uh, a, f uh, a flow aggregate in the hardware, not a flow. Uh, it's a flow aggregate. I want a counter only on that uh, so that I, uh, I can associate uh, an action to a flow rule which says count, and I just read that counter. Okay, so, so by reading it multiple times, and if it doesn't change, you know, you can age it out. Is that the technique? Nobody wants to put a time step in their hardware? As I said, I mean, it's not there. A lot of hardware vendors are solving it. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Thanks. Somebody wants to. Oh, yeah. Also, and, and Julie, mm -hmm. another question. You mentioned before that some hardware can deal with port ranges. Also, the general case. Uh, let's see. For instance, your hardware or can so the hardware can the same hardware in the same configuration can deal with uh, rules that are convenient, uh, um, classical, like. Um, key and value, a key and mask, and with ranges, yeah. you can do it on the same configuration? Yeah. We can do that, Jiri and TCAM on, on Spectrum as well? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah, keep going, please. Is there any more slides? Or? Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, so in addition to uh, the uh, TC action counter, um, uh, we also plan to have new offload hooks for TC police action. Uh, so right now, uh, TC police action is used for uh, rate limiting inbound and outbound traffic. And although for outbound uh, traffic uh, rate limiting, we already have queuing disciplines that can offload uh, shaping features. Uh, it's the TC police action that's most used for rate limiting ingress traffic. Uh, but currently, uh, there are no offload hooks for police action. So that's the Sorry. next step ahead. Which, which NIC is this? Uh, which which uh, hardware? Uh, yeah, so this is the 900 series. It has some limited police actions. Uh, no, this is a 900 series ICE driver, the 100 gig, yeah. Um, so uh, I'll just hand over to Anjali from, from the next slide to talk about challenges that we uh, faced while meeting our customer requirements and use cases. Um, Anjali, would you like to... Go ahead. Yeah. So I mean, uh, just I, I guess the problems that uh, you know most people talked about, they're very similar, and we are seeing um, uh, similar cases. Uh, you know, uh, I'll just uh, cover. Uh, although I'm not following the slide, I'm just going to cover a few things about uh, what we talked about counters. So. Um, Okay, so um, uh, so I mean, I should say that uh, we haven't uh, really seen a whole lot of TC problems as you know, Miller Knox and Broadcom have encountered, but we are dis discovering as we are adding features as well. Uh, uh, the counters, uh, you know, uh, you know, Amrita described one of the problems. Then uh, we have also looked at, at 
many different ways to solve it in the hardware. And I think Shirjit and a lot of people kind of covered uh, all the different ways. You can DMA the uh, you know, uh, counter info as packets or DMA to host memory or um, uh, you know, uh, do delta versus do absolute versus uh, uh, do it only uh, when there is a change in the flow and all those things. So I mean, um, yes, this is uh, occupying a significant bandwidth when we scale it to uh, millions of flows and uh, counter per flow. So we have to make sure that uh, we optimize not just the hardware but also uh, you know, the, the storage in the kernel, re retrieval from kernel to the user, uh, and things like that. So those are the things that uh, we'll be looking at. Um, uh, we also have some uh, more work to do on the offloads uh, which are uh, related to TCAMs, uh, the longest prefix match uh, TCAMs. Um, and uh, uh, that's um, available in our current generation hardware, which is the 900 series uh, 100 gig hardware. So we'll be looking at some more of that. Um, um, we're also seeing some you know, usage where TC Flower is limited and we've had back and forth between TC Flower versus U32 and um, uh, you know, uh, some limitations because of name fields and all those uh, you know, uh, can't use proprietary protocol types and all of the issues. So, um, and, and we've just started doing our performance numbers to see the flow rates, uh, uh, you know, the rule insertion rate kind of thing, and uh, Sridhar uh, most likely will present our work um, you know, shortly, or you'll see some patches uh, to help with whatever Vlad is doing. Um, so, yeah, and one of the things that we noticed is uh, when we are doing the rule insertion, there is multiple places where uh, the flow rules are being maintained, and so that's something that we need to definitely clean up. You know, the layers where it is being maintained is, uh, you know, in the kernel, in the drive. I mean, the drive itself is maintaining it, and if you're offloading to hardware, it's there. And then there is the layer above. Uh, you know, if you're uh, using any of the V switches, so it's it's stored in multiple places, and that's adding to the rule insertion delays as well. And you know, everywhere there's. I'm sure Andy is shaking his head, so <laughs> he's aware of that. Um, footprint. What you're worried? Both. Um, it's not just the memory footprint. Just maintaining uh, your uh, uh, status for flows. Uh, it inserts. Uh, you know, uh, it causes statefulness, which causes your CPU utilization to go higher. So. Um, uh, I guess there's just one last slide. What do you mean by trinary? It's not binary bits? What? Sorry? Trinary matches. What do you. Yeah, those are the TCAMs. Like you could do um, tri states, um, don't care states, basically. Yeah. What's the use case for that? Uh, uh, mega flows. Okay. <laughs> so. Yeah, so that's about it. So uh, yeah, we uh, rule updates is, is one of the area where we also will be putting a lot more work to see what can be done to optimize it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Andy, uh, Samuel, you're next. Th thank you, uh, Amrita and Anjali. some work that uh, my team at National has been doing. Uh, this is talking about TC, but the use case here is to, we're talking about uh, TC offload to Netronome hardware, uh, and this relates to OBS use case. Uh, most of this work was done by my colleague, John, uh, but he, he's not here today, so I'll be presenting. Um, so actually, we have a particular problem we're mm -hmm. trying to solve, and we have uh, two solutions. I may not have time to go through both of them, they're kind of similar. <coughs> so OBS itself uh, has this notion of what it calls internal ports. 
so these are not hidden, they're actual net devs, you can see them. But they have some specific uh, properties because of the way that they're implemented. Uh, and maybe the most common example of an internal port would be the bridge itself, the OVS bridge. Um, so to explain this fairly simply, uh, when the packet goes, <coughs> is uh, to be egressed uh, from one of these special ports. It's, it's kind of like a shortcut. Um, so it doesn't go through the entire stack. And so in particular, it doesn't go to the part of the stack where the TC hooks sit. So although we can, <coughs> we can uh, set up a TC rule sitting on this uh, device, on the ingress, uh, which is where we put all our other rules, it will never be hit. Uh, so this creates a problem. Uh, why, what is the use case? What, what, why do we even care? Um, so we're talking about um, situations where we're offloading, uh, where we ha have egress to a tunnel. Um, so in this case, um, essentially the packet will leave uh, OVS data path uh, to be egressed uh, to a, a tunnel net dev. <coughs> and then magically, uh, the uh, network stack will figure out, okay, so we, we do a, a neighbor lookup and whatever and figu uh, figure out, okay, so now this e now encapsulated packet should, outgress, it should, should egress onto the physical network and oh, the path for this, the IP address, uh, the source part of the, the endpoint belong to the bridge. And so then it sort of goes back into the bridge and then goes out. And in this point, we would like to apply TC rule because this is our, our offloading mechanism. Uh, and in that way, allow the hardware to know about this and process everything in hardware. But as I mentioned, the, the TC rule processing is basically skipped, uh, so it doesn't work. Uh, so I apologize, these diagrams are kind of complicated with uh, arrows going everywhere, but the, the basic idea is what I just explained just now is uh, the packet's coming in and then somehow it gets to the OVS kernel data path and it decides it's going to output to a, a VLAN. So it, it outputs to this uh, VLAN net dev, which then goes to the network stack, does a lookup and decides to output to the internal port and it's around about point four where the, the problems start. Um, in the software case, this is talking about the pure software case. This is all fine. Everything's working perfectly, no problems. Um, but we would like to offload this, and as I said, we'd like to offload it using OBS TC. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. The internal port is, is resides on top of ETH1, or it could go to multiple ETH kind of devices, is it? Yes. <coughs> so in this uh, particular case, uh, it's just the ETH1, but in the general case, what we'd really like to do is uh, so it's it typical to combine a lag with this, or a bond. And so then there will be two, but that's kind of an extra complication. Uh, we wanted to kind of simplify the discussion here a little. But yeah, in the general case, yes. <coughs> so what happens today uh, if we try to set this up? Um, yeah, so we, we would ha ordinarily have two obvious rules. So the import port would be E0, it matches on that, that's great. Maybe some other criteria as well. And then the out output, the action is simply to output to the VLAN, <coughs> and the, the VLAN net dev pushes on the, the packet, uh, sorry, the encapsulation. And then we need to match on this second rule uh, in order to output it to, to, the, to the network, to the physical network. Um, and so it would typically do this by matching on the input port, which is in this case the bridge itself, and maybe the source and destination uh, address, just to make it a little bit more fine-grained. <coughs> and uh, yeah, the, the output, the action would typically be output. You might have other actions as well. But so in the software, so so the problem is that the rule two is not being hit. So proposed solution number one, uh, and I think this is the preferred solution at this time. Um, is to make the lines uh, not straight, to have the more curves. Um, <laughs> just joking. Um, so the fundamental problem, from my point of view, is that the, when, when you're processing uh, these internal net devs, uh, the, the, the TC hook is, is bypassed. <coughs> so the ingress TC hook. And so uh, maybe obvious uh, solution to this is instead of 
applying the filter to ingress, uh, to apply it to egress. And in a sense, we are egressing. It's kind of confusing in my mind because the packet goes in and the, what's input on one side is output to another side. But in a sense, from the VXLAN NetDev point of view, we, we are egressing. And also from a bridge point of view, we're actually trying to push this packet out onto the physical network. So, so in a, in a, you can kind of think of this as egress. And if we do this, it works. Things are nice. Uh, what is required to achieve this? What is the software changes required? So the nice thing about this is it requires no changes to the kernel. Um, there, there, there's a, maybe a driver change, but no fundamental changes to OBS kernel data paths or to TC. We just need to update user space, in this case OBS user space, to tell it to attach its uh, filters uh, to egress instead of ingress. So this is kind of nice. And this is kind of the, the way we're thinking of going. And uh, we prototyped this, and it, it's working. And um, now net next is open. Well, if it's not net next, it doesn't look. Anyway, we're, we're ready to move forwards on this. Um, the other solution, which, uh, so this is my colleague's idea. My idea was uh, this one. Um, so the result is, is kind of the same. It, it, the difference is that we don't consider this to be egress. We still consider it to be ingress. And essentially what we do is we, we teach the internal port implementation, this magic function in the OVS directory, um, to actually use the ingress hooks. Um, and again, the, re the result is pretty good. Uh, both rules are, are processed and everything is fine. The cost of this in implementation terms is we need to update uh, the OBS kernel data path to teach it to use TC hooks, which in maybe is a correctness issue in moving things in a good direction, but it does add uh, extra complexity and extra cost uh, to, to that piece of code only for this use case. There's no benefit to the software on the use case. But because they yeah, don't, so you wouldn't ordinarily use TC in that. In that I, I, I think I'm still struggling. This, this port is just, you enter one side, you come out the other side. Or could Pretty you, much. could it be a me read redirect to ingress based on a flaw or tag or something? In, on the internal port, you have a me read action, it looks at something in the, in, in, in the packet, metadata or data, and decides which ingress hook you should go to by redirecting it there then it's just a policy issue, right? I mean, it doesn't make internal port anything special, basically. Or does does it make sense? Yeah, so the question, in this approach, we allow uh, ingress uh, policy to be applied uh, to packets that are received into the internal port. Right. <laughs> okay, I, I'm not an obvious guy, so I'm still struggling <laughs> to understand it sounds. It sounds more. What, what you want the. What you want to achieve is to redirect to some port, bypassing all of TC, basically. Well, that's not what we want. What we want to achieve. That's what is implemented at this time. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you introduce this special port just for that purpose. There this is internal uh, port. I, I'm not introducing these ports. They exist. <laughs> I mean. Uh, yeah, yes. Okay. So at some point, yeah. the OBS developers introduced this thing. Right. Right. Like you say. Yes. Okay. Um, and and I imagine that the motivation for the implementation bypassing things is is uh, for performance, and that they had no new use case at the time. This is before TC was used in conjunction with OBS. They would have had no use case for this. And and even though we've had OBS TC for for some years now, it's only now that uh, we're trying to implement more complicated um, features of OBS. Um, that, that we're running against these kind of problems. So actually, what is the use case? Is the host trying to talk to a VM? Um, so in this case, it would be the, the packet is coming. Uh, typically, the, the packet would be coming from a VM mm -hmm. and then through the OVS and then being uh, put out onto the wire, but when it's put out onto the wire, it's encapsulated in, in, in some tunneling protocol, in this case VXLAN, but it could be GRE or anything else. Okay, but the ultimate destination of the packet is? Is outside. Outside? 
But if the internal port is on the host, right? Yeah. Internal port on the OBS. So you the internal port, you, it's kind of like the bridge itself. Mm -hmm. So the packet is coming from the VM, it's traversing the bridge actually twice, and then it's going out to the network. And the reason it's doing it twice is one is to select the fact that it's going to be uh, going out a tunnel. And then the tunnel endpoint itself is the bridge. Okay. Uh, and so you, you might say, we'll put the tunnel endpoint somewhere else. And sure, you can do that. But the, the, the thing is that this is kind of the way people use this software stack at this time already. <laughs> So I, I feel like I'm not understanding your question, actually. <laughs> no, no, I'm just looking at it and I'm seeing that you know something coming off the network stacks needs to be redirected to yeah. something that may be encapsulating VXLAN, for example. It is. Right? And VXLAN is riding on top of some physical ETH device. No, 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 no. Um, VXLAN is riding on top. See, this is the key point. Right. It, the first part is correct. And right. th this is not really a contentious problem. Right. Um, the thing is that the VXLAN is sitting not on ETH1. Right. VXLAN is sitting on top of the bridge. OK, so the packet comes into ETH0, hits VXLAN, gets decapsulated, I guess? No, it's the other way. We, we, it it encapsulate. gets encapsulated, hits, and then it needs to be redirected to ETH1. So in it this gets, case. It gets right. encapsulated. Encapsulated by the VXLAN0. Yep. And then it needs, to, as you say, needs to be redirected to ETH1. Yeah, I mean, okay. So, so, so Jamal, to your question, we only deal with shared tunnel devices with CC. We don't, when we introduce tunnel key action, we're only doing that for shared tunnel devices. We don't do it for the old style tunnel devices. This one thing. Yeah, so what's uh, not shown here uh, is. And Simon, uh, maybe, I don't know if you. Yeah. Like, maybe people try here to stress, hey, why, don't we, why do we need that? So if you, if you can, I don't know, describe the use case. Well, so Which is not covered by today's, the way we do offload today, Netronome and Mellanox drivers. Or I don't think the Broadcom driver already offloads well, tunnels. So, but so oftentimes people are using OpenStack to configure OBS in, in production, and w in which case it's very common to place, uh, it, it's all about where the endpoint of the tunnel goes, and to place the endpoint onto the bridge itself it is the, the like canonical OpenStack way of doing that. And it's in that case that you hit this problem. Okay, so it's just to cater to existing bad habits out there with OpenStack? That is one possible interpretation. Okay. Uh, it's like we, our UAP, UAPIs, right? We can't take them back now. Is that? So it, it's like we, we, we have a, a, a kernel which is exposing various different ways of doing things. And the people over in OpenStack decided for some reason, I don't, to, to utilize a certain subset of those features. And that's this subset. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I guess I, it looked very complex to me, but I, you have a use case, someone wants, uh, you know, you, you, it, it make, it's legit from that perspective. It seems like you have a use case. I, just, I still not quite get it. It looks like, you know, all these link lines could probably yes. be replaced by two, <laughs> by two lines. <laughs> So it might have been a, the, the complication in the diagram comes because in fact the packet loops around. But I might have expressed the diagram better by drawing two separate bridges even though they're the same bridge. Which would be the same use case for, from a uh, you know, software implementation point of view. The kernel patches for, or what, what is the suggestion? So the suggestion is to go to the previous option. Um, where there's no kernel changes. I mean, we have to do a little bit of work in the driver to actually offload it. But there's no core stack changes, which is one of the main attractions of this. What's on the following slide, the one we were just staring at, requires uh, changes to the OBS data path to basically teach it to use the T TC ingress. Yeah, that, that would make more sense for, so whatever feature you end up adding could be used by TC as well. Yeah, so the ingress idea was my idea. <laughs> so of course I think it's better, but <laughs> but um, so it's I, also good money. But <laughs> but th this egress idea is um, seems to have more traction. 
I guess uh, all seems to be nodding in agreement, or you, you guys must have discussed, or? So, Simon submitted it, and some people will review it. I'm less involved in that. I think we already submitted the, um, th this version. It's on, on the OBS list. I think you've seen it, right? Okay, so I think the conclusion is semi-inconclusive, but we will try to move forward on, on this. Unless someone, I don't know, disagrees violently. <laughs> uh, I, I don't understand enough to disagree. Okay, right. We can, we can talk right. about this again. Thanks so everyone I'm, for I'm your just time. I'm just going to agree because, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think we're a bit Thank over. You. Yeah, we're on yeah. time. Oh, Sorry. minus one. Uh, Lucas is here. Thank you. Excuse me. Connect a laptop. Over there? Okay. You have HDMI, I think. Yep. Okay. So, a couple of, well, a uh, few new developments that I've been working on lately. Um, I'm in the middle of pushing some um, quality of life improvements to TDC uh, up to the kernel. I'm probably about halfway through those right now. A lot of them are just um, uh, reporting improvements. So now, you know, when something fails, you can actually see what the commands being executed up to that point were. Um, what's... I've actually gone and done and I'm going to present today and uh, this will go in as soon as I'm finished pushing up those other changes. Um, we now actually have the ability to send traffic and uh, validate commands that are being, um, or validate that the commands under test are actually working as intended. So you can actually see if a rule is hit or if it's not hit based on um, the kind of packet you're sending. So there's, uh, the method I'm doing for that is, um, I'm actually using Scappy as a, um, as a plugin for TDC, uh, which you can actually see here in the sample test case that I wrote. So the packet will actually be fired in the, if you're familiar with the general phases of uh, TDC test cases, or test case execution. Uh, it's in the post execute, so it will actually come right after the command that under test is executed. So as long as that goes okay, then um, TDC will come along and then execute um, what it discovers in the SCAPI block. So we're specifying an interface that we want to do it on. Um, that's actually hedging against future improvements where we have more complex uh, setups. So right now this is actually just firing out of the, um, the host namespace into the container, um, how many times you want the packet to run, and then this string. So this is actually evaluated directly by SCAPI after being passed in by the plugin. So you can construct a packet with um, very specific um, configuration. Uh, whatever you don't specify, it actually gets filled in with defaults. So you notice I'm only actually specifying uh, at the IP level the source address. It'll be filled in with um, a generic destination address. It doesn't actually matter because we're only testing that, you know, this rule is being hit. 
Okay. So then that brings on to the next improvement that I made, and this sort of came at the prompting of uh, Stephen Heminger and um, a message on the NetDev mailing list a little while back. And that's the ability to actually match using uh, the JSON output from TC rather than regular expressions because they are incredibly squishy and prone to failing whenever there's a change in the uh, a change in the output, whereas the JSON output is not actually going to change that much. So there's a new structure in here. Uh, it will actually replace, um, I haven't deprecated the regular expression pattern matching because one thing I discovered is that it is actually still useful in some cases. But now if you provide this match JSON block instead, um, you specify the path like where in the JSON um, the value that you want to look for is, and then the actual value. Okay. Um, so now we're actually going to look with this test case. We're going to see that was um, was this rule actually hit? So did we see a packet from source IP sixteen sixty one sixteen sixty one? And actually, just for a comparison, we've got another one, but it's identical, but we're looking for, um, we're firing off the pack three times as opposed to looking for just one. So you can see the results there. What are you doing there? So I'm actually just running uh, TDC with the test. Uh, well, with these two test cases, okay? Mm -hmm. So you can see the results. So the first one passed as intended. Uh, the second one. Sorry, what was the first test doing? I can't see that. No. Oh, we're just matching against a specific IP address. Okay, you send, you send a packet, a specifically crafted packet or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. What did you send? I'm sorry. Uh, where? What was the packet that you sent? Oh, um, it's that right there. Okay, so if we look at TCP dump, we'll see you sending that packet. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the second test case, we're actually looking to see that it only hit one time, uh, in, but we actually sent it three times, so you can see that this test case did indeed fail because it counted three packets matching that IP address. Okay. So um, this is still just kind of proof of concept, mostly because it requires adding new things to the um, to the test case definition. So whenever I have to add something there, I get a little paranoid and worried that I maybe complicated the design too much. So I will be looking for feedback on whether this looks reasonable to everyone. Um, if there are changes, I'm happy to make them before I push them up. Um, I can also uh, basically put this patch out as an RFC just so people can, you know, check it over. Um, there will be some really weird things that you might see in the code, especially for the JSON matching, because I'm trying to follow the TDC philosophy of limiting the number of external Python packages that are required to run it. So I had to unfortunately invent some of my own code for checking this when I know that there is already stuff in place that will do this. So I do apologize, but um, like I said, at this point I am just seeking feedback for um, the new control options, basically. So I think it would be interesting to, <clears throat> to create some sort of fuzzy testing for, you, for the different classifiers. Yeah. Different actions, you just send a bunch of crap and see what, how, what the kernel does. Yep, so that could be done now, too. It, it could be done with this, or you need another tool? I don't think you would need another tool for that. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's still working under the TDC paradigm of, you know, like, test, mm. test one command at a time. But, right. Um, you know, you can maybe fire a whole bunch of different, like, wild and crazy packets and see if any of them actually hit a rule when they're not supposed to, right. or right. if you have reason to believe that's a thing. Okay, we are out of time. Any yeah, questions? Sorry. Questions? 
Cool. Oh, wow, we're going to make it. So, sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Oh, yeah. oh sorry. Yeah. sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, bit of a delay. Um, well, first off, thank you uh, for working on the test. Very important. <laughs> um, and then secondly, we found some issues with using some of the default values in Scapey for some of the tests. You might want to look at look at that. Um, you you might not run into it, but but we with uh, with our offloads have, have run into some of the. So for instance, the default destination MAC address could could be an issue. Yeah, um, I actually did have um, I did have some problems with Scappy um, because apparently in like a very sh short multi month or six month period um, between the latest. Uh, version that's available uh, on Git for Scappy, and the latest version that was available through um, Python installer, um, it was completely incapable of. The older version was completely incapable of crafting IFE packets. So, okay. um, it would still accept it. It thought it was doing well, but no, it was producing garbage. So yeah, I, I, okay, I sort of understand that. Um, and I, I can't remem remember now, but. Um, would, uh, would, would Scappy then be one of the um, dependencies that, that you've added to the test? Then? Um, so in other words, you'd need to have Scappy installed to yes. be able to run the test? Yeah. Okay. That's the, I think that's fair. I think everyone we already have, have Python installed. in there, so. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, not that's fair. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. It's, it's just um, to make it as easy as possible, I do try to limit the amount of external packages because like you go on uh, like say stack exchange how do I do this in Python oh look there's a package for it okay. but the, it's not part of the core system so I'm yeah. trying to yeah. and then l l last question not all of the I think not all of the, the TC uh, uh, rules have have been JSON fied um, nope. are you aware of that yes yeah. I, okay. I'm very aware of that um, okay. I try to make them as I can but I'm still actually really depending on everyone else to help out because I don't actually code for, like I don't uh, submit code for the kernel um, affecting the TC subsystem. So I actually depend on the people who are writing the code to maybe help me come up with these tests and submit them. Okay. So <laughs> Yeah, as, as Vlad was saying earlier, now as yeah. people submitting patches better submit co uh, test cases as well. Yeah. And I mean, uh, there's a lot of test cases to be written. I, I just thought of fuzzing, for example. That's a, a very interesting uh, scenario. Yeah. yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Roman, you next. Okay, five minutes. I think it's we have one minute before the break, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Roman from uh, Mojo Tato Networks. So a while back, we were involved in uh, creating, designing a TC-based uh, billing system for one of uh, North American serv service providers. And uh, as part of that work, we came up with a new TC action called the Quota Enforcement, or uh, QE action. So uh, the main idea of that thing is uh, that every subscriber has its own uh, quota limit or credit limit assigned in bytes. And uh, uh, it's like a meter. Uh, as a packet hits this uh, action, the quarter is decremented by the size of the packet. If it exceeds, uh, then the packet will be dropped. Otherwise, it passes. Uh, but it can be uh, reprogrammed in, the to, in order to create and construct more uh, uh, sophisticated service graphs. For example, instead of simply dropping the packet, we may <coughs> Uh, apply a policer and simply squeeze the uh, user data pipe to some low value. Um, uh, so this uh, action uh, depends on three main parameters. First is the quota, as I said, which is defined in bytes. Uh, second is the overhead. Overhead is essentially uh, it's not fair to charge user for, for example, Ethernet header. So we deduct this from the, uh, from the, from the we, we do not deduct this from the quota. Uh, uh, and the third one is the multiplier. Multiplier is interesting thing. Some data plans allow, for example, uh, free traffic on uh, at night. In this case, multiplier will be zero, so we don't charge anything. The quota remains the same. Or it, 
a user can be charged half the price on weekends. So in this case, this multiplier is 0 0.5 sort of thing. So in this case, he, he pays uh, just half the price. Uh, in addition to TC standard uh, stats, this action also collects uh, the stats per uh, direction, uplink and downlink, because in many plans, uh, they have different uh, quotas for the upstream or for the downstream. So, and uh, as a billing system polls this action, it will make these uh, calculations. Um, uh, what else? Yes. Uh, so, this has been deployed in the data center of that uh, service provider for quite a long time, and um, we are planning to upstream this in the next few months uh, after some cleanup and uh, everything. So, I uh, don't have time to demonstrate it now, but whoever is interested can drop by my desk and I can show you on my laptop QV action in action. So, um, that's it. That's it. Oh, thank you. On time. Yeah. Um, so, we, can I make a suggestion that the stats, maybe we should have a discussion outside of here at some point, if everybody's around, and the TDC test, I, I, I don't know if you get involved or how you, let's, I think all the players are here, Marcello, uh, uh, Lucas, maybe we can get together as well, right? If you guys could meet, maybe in, it's best to meet face to face. Thank you.